Well, they were the opening minutes of Music for 18 Musicians by Steve Reich. Uh, Steve Reich, one of those 18 musicians, and it's a great pleasure to welcome him back to the music show. Thanks for coming. Thank you in. very much. Um, some of your pieces are obviously about things, um, different trains, the right. cave, right. Um, WTC 911, mm -hmm. and others apparently not. Right. Music for 18 musicians, right. four organs, six pianos, etc. Double sextet. Double sextet. Does, does your music usually start with a musical impulse? Well, I think you, you've outlined a very good distinction. I mean, if, if I'm writing a vocal piece, then the very first thing is, what is the text? And not only what is the text, usually I'll, I'll excerpt from the text, what you know, construction do I make of the text? Uh, if it's not a text, then the first question is, what are the instruments I'm writing for? I don't tend to write for uh, standard ensembles. I don't write for the orchestra. I don't write for, uh, actually, string quartet. All my string quartets are really three quartets because I keep wanting to have these uh, doubling of identical instruments. And if you have a string quartet, well, where's the other viola? Where's the other cello? <laughs> so uh, inventing my own ensemble becomes, in a sense, the beginning of the inspiration, if you will, for the piece. Uh, and um, then comes the agony of actually trying to begin no matter what. Yes. Which is definitely the hardest part of writing any piece is just getting started. And at that point, it, it presumably does become a musical impulse, however it began before. Well, one prays for that, that, that will that will that will happen. But you know, one has to go into the studio every day, and uh, you know, um, as Thomas Edison said, ninety nine percent perspiration, one percent inspiration. And no perspiration. Forget if you wait for the moment to strike, you'll be dead, and it won't have struck. <laughs> so, what do you do at, the, at, at that moment? Do you, you, do you force it? Well, I try to think of, uh, for instance, uh, for pieces um, pieces both with text and without text. Uh, I try to map it out harmonically, which really began in 1976 with Music for 18 Musicians. Prior to that, uh, I was working with uh, short melodic modules, and they were the basis of the piece, because the pieces were basically 100% contrapuntal, and the harmonies resulted from whatever the counterpoint was. Uh, starting with Music for 18 Musicians, I did what musicians in the West have done for, for thousands of years, which is to begin with a, a harmonic ground plan and and work forward from that. So, uh, again, after the instrumentation, I'll then say, well, you know, I mean, how many movements are there? Three movement piece, that's probably, probably a, you know, 15 minute piece. Uh, if we get into five movements, then we're, we're talking maybe 25 minute piece. Uh, what's the form of the movement? I, I've been very heavily influenced by Bella Bartok. So, whenever I do five uh, movements, it tends to be A, B, C, B, A. Mm. Um, you could get that from, you know, Christ Log and Tordes Banden too, but uh, there are certain, you know, Western formula that work for me just fine and and i and i use them so do you so those are the kinds of things that you know you could call it busy work but it's really it's it's essential things that you do beforehand and then once you know well okay i'm in two sharps and i tend to start i'm 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 a, I'm a great lover uh, i'm a great lover of d major it seems to work for me so uh, or, or or b minor or you know any anything with two sharps so i will start working in there. And generally, I gravitate towards uh, dominance, subdominance, simple, uh, basic parts of the, of the Western vocabulary. Why dominance? Dominance are, dominance want to go somewhere. And you, if you sort of hold them back from doing what they would do, you have a kind of energy, and you can then sort of channel that energy in different ways. And uh, so that is, you know, roughly, sp it's, not, it's not always that way, but that is sort of a general idea of how I might go about beginning something. Do you have the opposite um, experience as well? Do you do you go to the studio and think not dominant this time? I, I can't face dominant again. I can always face dominant again. <laughs> I'm hooked on that. Uh, no, but there are certain you know, yes, there are certain things that. Uh, well, I mean, I'll give you a, a, a different version, but an answer to a similar question. Uh, in when nine eleven actually happened in in two thousand one. Uh, shortly after it happened, uh, I'm, we live four blocks from Ground Zero. Uh, some reporters asked me, you know, well, are you going to do a piece about this? Because I had already done uh, different trains and people knew that I worked with documentary material. At the time, I was just finishing up Three Tales, which was a video album full of sampling, electronics, you know, 
manipulation of samples. And I said, frankly, I said, I am so up to there with this kind of working that if I see one more sample, I'm going to get sick. So the answer is no. You know, I have no ideas about it. And I, what I need to do is to take a good long break of just writing music for instruments and voices. And for seven years, that's all I did. So for me, I find it's very important to... Um, uh, know what will keep the fires burning and mm. throw the right logs on the fire. Otherwise, if the fire goes out, then I'm not happy and neither is anybody else. No, no. You're listening to The Music Show on our end, and my guest is Steve Reich. I was interested to hear you mention, you know, the composers of the last thousand years. Do you feel part of of a classical tradition? I mean, your music is played by classical musicians more often than not, and right. it's played in concert halls more often than not. Right. Yes. I recently suggested that people can think, instead of pop classical, think notated, non-notated, because that really is, the, I mean, uh, uh, particularly, well, particularly now, but particularly for a long time, that, 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 that's, that's a big distinction. There's always an oral tradition going on. That preceded notation. Um, but nevertheless, you know, those musicians who learn how to read form a kind of um, a subculture a, uh, who are distinct from those who don't do that. And, uh, for instance, when I wrote the, this rock piece, Two Times Five, where, which used rock and roll instruments, it turned out there are only certain rock and roll musicians who have already gone through conservatory who can, in fact, read very well. And, you know, they're, they're getting to be more of those nowadays. And that's an interesting phenomenon. But it's, in a sense, it's, it's not a new one. I mean, I personally have learned more from the music which precedes JSB before 1750 than I have, let's say, between the music between Haydn and Wagner. I'm not really, I don't think I really learned anything except that I didn't want to do it about Sonata Allegro form. Um, I admire particularly certain works of Beethoven, but beyond that, that entire period is just a period where... I acknowledge that there are towering geniuses who I just, you know, don't have any magnetic attraction to and don't really learn from. I learn more from, you know, Periton or, or Machot mm. than I Many do from, 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 from Beethoven or, 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 or uh, certainly any of the romantics. Yes. Uh, and again, I think that this, this is sort of um, in the period, in the, in the early part of the 20th century when Stravinsky was, you know, back to Bach, this 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 was a this is something I guess you know I I really got started with Stravinsky my my uh, my card carrying membership uh, you know, has an Igor stamped on it <laughs> so uh, I I related to that entirely but it was it was the neoclassical Stravinsky that, that appealed to you no it was no it was not it was the idea that in the Rite of Spring you can have these and then which is it's kind of a G modal minor thank you very much it's mm. you know we know what key is it. it's not like wagner you know we do know where we are internally uh, stravinsky really throughout his career even you know even in canticum sacrum and agam the 12 tone serial pieces was able to maintain his affinity for what he called the polar attraction of sound mm. which was his way of dealing with saying you know traditional harmony is not really i'm not really doing that but i'm dealing with that energy that is within the tonal system and uh, that is what I think was restored by himself, by Bela Bartok and others, uh, from a period when uh, Wagner, you know, was was trying to dissolve the tonal system. Schoenberg read it correctly and said, "Well, let's really dissolve it and, and produce something new to organize sound in a way that's totally not tonal." Uh, I understood that, I respected that, but I didn't feel one ounce of attraction towards it. I had to learn how to do it. I mean, you can't study with Luciano Berger and not learn how to write 12-tone music. But my solution to, <laughs> to writing 12-tone music was never invert the row, never retrograde the row, <laughs> never transpose the row. Just repeat it over and over again. <laughs> and Berger saw that. He said, if you want to write tonal music, why don't you write tonal music? I said, that's what I'm trying to do. But you were lucky you had Berio. Yes, I'm be lucky I had Berio. If I had stocked house, he would have thrown me out of the room. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> You mentioned the neoclassical pieces, the back to Bach pieces of Stravinsky. And one of the things that he said he was trying to do in those pieces was avoid emotion. I mean, he even left out the violins a lot of the time because he thought they were too emotional. Where does emotion figure in your music, Steve? 
I'm trying to think back to a rehearsal yesterday. Oh yeah, we were rehearsing yesterday right in the, the in the um, uh, the Sydney Opera House, got in the Utsen room where they have all the rehearsals, with the uh, uh, Australian group Synergy, the percussion group, and they were doing the Mallet Quartet. And uh, the way they were playing, it was quite different than any of the other. It was commissioned by four different groups, and this was the first time I'd heard Synergy do it. And um, they took different sections of it at different dynamic levels. They made rather, rather large distinctions of, of dynamics. And they said to me, was up? well, you know, what did you think? I said, I, said, I think it's great. I said, I, I mean, I never imagined that. It's not in the score, but I tend to undermark anyway. It's kind of like a Baroque score, you know, mezzo forte, goodbye, have a good time. Uh, and uh, that, that they had come up with that gave the piece a whole a different mm, feel, which... Uh, I think any music which doesn't have the ability to to be reinterpreted and to show different facets of itself that the composer may never have thought of, mm. there's something wrong with that music. So yes, um, if people if my music doesn't move people, I am crushed. I am miserable. I am a very unhappy composer. I want people to love it. I mean, I'm just simple as that. But uh, you know, ultimately, I have no control over that. All I can do is to say to write something that I love, and then hope you will too. My guest is Steve Reich on The Music Show on RN. It's easy to see the, the effect that your music has had on oh, armies of other composers. Uh, we see where it's what it's led to. What about where it comes from? Um, right. I know that you, 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 you played in the first performance of In C. Right. Uh, in 1964, so you know the, the music was in the air, but but I'm wondering what lies behind it. Do you think? I mean, is it is there any point in talking about what Michael Tilson Thomas would call American mavericks? You know, composers from Ives through to Cage. Is there something specifically American in what we called minimalism in the 1960s? Well, it's a complicated question. I would say I'll answer the first part about NC first and then the second part second. Uh, uh, NC was a very inf influential piece, but please uh, try to remember uh, you, to your listeners as well that NC, as originally written, had no pulse. And I wish the people around the world would play Terry Riley's NC and not Terry Riley's NC with Steve Reich's pulse. And they would find a very, very, very different piece. Perhaps you could just explain. I mean, you were responsible for putting in that high pulsing Well, I'm a piano. drummer, and it was a, a piece I thought was problematic, and I suggested to him, I said, I think we need a pulse here. And he said, mm, let's give it a try, and he liked it, and that's it. But it was never, you know, I believe in credit where credit is due, and I don't get that credit. So thank you. I'd like to have the credit, and I'd like people to understand how important that is, because once you take it away, you have a very different piece. It was done without pulse in Krakow by the uh, uh, Klangfarben Wien and Wien, and uh, it was sort of a uh, introspective kind of very very different experience very interesting i would imagine yes it's very very interesting anyway now to answer the rest of your question uh i love michael Tilson thomas he's been a wonderful friend to me and i admire him both musically and personally but i think that the idea that that, that i mean i learned absolutely nothing from charles ives except that i loved him as a composer and absolutely nothing from john cage except that i you know liked his music prior to 1950 and have no part of any of that tradition whatsoever. Um, but there were lots and lots and lots of things in America that made this music possible. Not at all the things that, that, that have just been mentioned. What happened in the 1960s in America was uh, a whole slew of things. Uh, Non-Western music was being performed regularly throughout the United States. Uh, recordings of West African music were available. I ended up making a trip there. Uh, Balinese and occasionally Javanese gamelans were played at Wesleyan University. People started to play them and understand how the music was put together. I myself was asked in 73 and 74 to go out to the West Coast, form my own band, and play in a, in a Balinese gamelan, which I did. Uh, John Coltrane is a huge influence on this. In 1961, way before in C64, in 1961, John Coltrane released Africa Brass. Africa Brass is about 17 minutes on E. So you say, hey man, what are the changes? It's E. No, 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 what are the changes? E, E for 16 minutes. Well, you get some, come on. How can you, 
you're going to board the pants, so everybody's going to walk out the door. No. So how does John Coltrane accomplish holding people, riveting people, for 16 minutes on one harmony? Well, if you have uh, Elvin Jones, an incredible drummer, a lot of rhythmic complexity. If you work with Eric Dolphy, who scored for a lot of brass instruments, including French horns, doing these whooping elephant through the jungle glissandos to, to begin the piece. And you have Coltrane himself playing sometimes gorgeous melodies, sometimes just screaming through the tenor or the, the soprano saxophone. You have melodic invention, you have rhythmic invention, and you have tambourine invention, and they supply the interest that, and, they, and the constant harmony just sort of builds the tension. So you have that coming in. You have Motown. Uh, there was a guy by the name of Junior Walker, and he did a tune called Shotgun. And it had a bass line that went bum, ba da na ba ma da, ba da na ba ma da. You're waiting for the change. There isn't any change. <laughs> there had never been a tune in my memory where there's no B section. Tunes are A B C, you know, A B A. Well, no, this was just and the tension and the you know energy that's brought up with you waiting for this and not getting released was something new. It was in the air. So here you have the stuff coming in from Motown. You have the stuff coming in from John Coltrane. You have the stuff coming in from outside the West. You have a kindling of interest on my part and others in 12th century or 11th century organum in Paris in the 11th and 12th century, where long held, the, the Gregorian chant is kind of pulled out like in slow motion to these enormous proportion so that each note of a melody sounds like a drone, but it's not a drone. It's just a very long note, and then it's going to change. So the harmonic rhythm is glacial, and this is what's in the air in the 1960s. Harmonic rhythm slows down to, uh, to a degree of slowness or static nature that was unheard of in the West. Nevertheless, harmony is back. Harmony, which had been singularly missing with Boulez and Stockhausen and Berio and Cage, which had been verboten in any normal way, is back with a vengeance, but because of its durational nature, is radically different. So that um, is why I believe uh, that, that this kind of music happened in America in the mid-60s. Did you feel like a radical at the time? No, I was just loving what I was doing and doing what I wanted to do, but realizing that I was kind of off in the corner and, and you know, that a lot of people thought I was nuts or infantile or, you know, uh, something to be maybe a little bit nervous about. Yes. Yeah. You, you mentioned the doublings before uh, and your attraction to doubling instruments. Uh, could, you, could you say why? Well, I don't mean doubling. You may have misunderstood. I don't mean doublings like we have traditional doublings in the orchestra where the, where the first and second flute play the same line no. for, for, for strength, which has its place, obviously. Um, no, what I was talking about is, uh, again, a story when uh, I, the double sextet began with a phone call from the woman, Jenny Billifield, who was the director of Boosley and Hawks. And she said, Steve, you've got to write a piece for, for, for uh, Ace Blackbird. And I said, I've heard about them. I heard they're really fantastic players. What's their instrumentation? She said, well, one flute, one clarinet, one violin, one cello, one piano, one <laughs> percussion. I said, Jenny, I, I can't write for an ensemble like that. And she said, sleep on it. <laughs> well, I didn't sleep on it. But I began thinking, well, I have all these pieces where I have pre-recorded musicians, like on all the counterpoint pieces where they're playing against recording. What if this group were to do that? And I have two flutes, two clarinets, so that... What I'm looking for are the possibilities of unison cannons. Unison cannons played by identical instruments so that they blend to form a contrapuntal web where you really don't know who's playing what. And that goes all the way back to it's going to rain, but of course it can appear in a vastly more complicated melodic harmonic context as it begins to do music for 18 musicians and it just keeps on going. So I called her back the next day and said, look, you know, if they're willing to do that, then I'm, I think we could have a great piece. She called them up. They said, oh, wonderful. And we did. No one to pull it surprise. And there we are. <laughs> the, the, the string quartet pieces you've done for the Kronos Quartet, right. which, which have typically two other string quartets. No, yeah, right, a total of three or four. Yeah, yeah uh, recorded by them exactly, um, yeah. so that they're playing live against recordings of their multiple selves. Why not write for string orchestra? Uh 
number of reasons. First of all, uh, in different trains, uh, it's impossible to do it otherwise than it is because every time there's a new speaker in different trains, there's a change of tempo, mm -hmm. and it's an irrational change of tempo. It isn't like quarter note equals half note or quarter, you know, triplet equals eighth mm -hmm. or anything like that. Uh, and the uh, the making of the pre-recorded tape was enormously complicated with two separate click tracks. And the way the piece is written is that the live quartet, when the tempo changes, is tacit. They don't play. And they simply listen to the new tempo, and then in two, three, four bars, they join in. And so in performance, it's it's not that difficult no, a piece to easy. play. Yeah. So uh, there was an idea by a very, very talented uh, composer who's been a very champion of my music, to uh, say, well, I'll, I, the conductor, will wear a click track and we'll have a string orchestra. And when I change tempo, they'll just change the tempo with me. <laughs> Musicians don't change tempo on a dime to an unrelated tempo. So every time this happened, there'd be kind of a shudder and a hiccup that would go through the string orchestra. And I finally said to him, I said, you know, I appreciate, you know, the support, but, you know, this is, this, is, this doesn't work. So we, we withdrew that, that addition. Uh, triple quartet. Uh, triple quartet does exist in three versions: one for a, pre a, a single string quartet and two recordings of that string quartet. Uh, you will hear it here. I I don't know it, the student orchestra is having a hard time with it, but if they play it, you will hear it with twelve musicians. And it, I've heard it played at Juilliard with twelve young people fantastically well. So mm -hmm. it can be played with three string quartets, mm -hmm. twelve musicians. And there is a version for small string orchestra where you have three to a part and you have thirty six players. I don't like that as much, but some people some people really like it. So, and I guess the other answer to that question is, is that the Kronos Quartet keep commissioning you. So that's why you write for them. Yeah, well, I mean, cer certainly they, they, uh, they, uh, they, they uh, people I respect enormously, and uh, whenever I write for them, I seem to come up with a, one of my better pieces. So, yes, I do that. 